Hi, RBC. I want to talk to you today for a few minutes about God's sovereignty and the fact that God's in control. You know, it's important to talk about this, and it's actually important to talk about it in a dark time like this, a time of economic crisis, which really, it's not even so much about the money as it's about the dignity of working and all those jobs and all those businesses and certainly the nearness of death and the physical danger that many people find themselves in. But especially in times like that, we start to wonder, well, is God in control? Is the devil doing this? What's really happening? This time is unique, but the Bible insists everywhere that God is completely and totally in control, even in the darkest times and the most difficult things. Here's a scripture from the Old Testament, and I picked this as one of dozens that I could have picked. Amos chapter 3, verse 6. Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? Amos 3, 6. Even disaster coming, it won't come, it says, unless the Lord has done it. That's a striking verse. It's sobering in its ramifications and its implications, and we want to understand it properly. In the Old Testament context, what the prophets were emphasizing was when they went to this city or that city, what they were saying was, hey, all these small g gods that you all worship, they're not the ones that bring plague. They're not the ones that bring drought and difficulty. God is sovereign over all of these things. Well, in our context, it's not so much small g gods as it is sort of the materialism of evolution or random mutation, where we would insist with scripture that plagues, viruses, famines, fires, tsunamis, earthquakes, storms, all of this, it ultimately is controlled by the living God in whom each one of us lives and moves and has our being. Viruses are not entities that talk among themselves and decide, well, let's get bad things going in China and then let's jump over to Wisconsin and let's do this and that. Calamities, whether they're viruses or storms or whatever they are, they don't come about by chance or by blind luck or by random mutation. Ultimately, we go back to God as the first cause. God has the whole world in his hands and not a single sparrow falls from a single tree without his knowing and without his divine control. Now, of course, when we come to sin and death, the Bible also says by man sin entered the world and death through sin. So death passed to all men because all men sinned. And we know that the Bible teaches there was a time when there was no sin and no death. And by demonic decision and by human decision, sin came into the world. So we're in the deep end of the doctrinal pool here, but just let's just settle it with like, a, like one big verse from the Old Testament and one big verse from the New Testament. The big verse from the Old Testament is Genesis 50, verse 20. Genesis 50, verse 20, which is the verse where Joseph says to his brothers, you meant it for evil but God meant it for good. The story of Joseph almost recapitulates the story of the first two brothers, Abel and Cain. That instance of fratricide and murder, it's almost reduplicated in Joseph's story, and his brothers are going to murder him, but at the last minute they decide, well, we can make a little money if we sell him into slavery, and the whole story goes on. But when Joseph finally comes back around at the end of the narrative, he says to his brothers, as for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. He doesn't say you meant it for evil, but God turned it around and used it for good. He says you meant it for evil and God meant it for good. So it's almost as if we have 100% and 100%. We have human causality and what they meant, and then we have divine causality and what God meant. And 100 and 100, and yet we're still understanding the same event. And then the New Testament reference for this, similar to the Genesis 50, 20 reference, is that reference in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, we have the greater Joseph, our Lord Jesus Christ, and we have the explanation of his crucifixion. 
and the question is, why was Christ crucified? And on the one hand, Christ was crucified because the Pharisees hated him and Judas sold him out and the Romans dealt with him. And so it was 100% the act of the, these evil people. But yet we also know, even from the prophecy in Isaiah, that it pleased the Lord to bruise him and crush him. So on the day of Pentecost, Peter puts this together by saying in Acts 2.23, Jesus, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and slain him. There again, we have 100 and 100. We have Judas and the Jews and the Romans 100% doing their will. And yet we have the action and the will and the divine sovereignty of Almighty God. So to sum up, this is certainly saying to us that nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens because God was looking the other way at a bunch of demons or a bunch of evil people or just a bunch of uh, random atoms in a virus decided to do something bad. God is totally sovereign and totally in control. He's in control of where we are right now, and he's in control of what the calendar will reveal when we can meet together again in the same room in physical proximity with one another. And we can trust him for the timing, and we can trust him for the outcome. Let's end in that wonderful, mysterious, and majestic text in Romans 11. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given to him that we might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen.